Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, editor in chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, tax inclusive. Historically, the tax bar has developed a reputation for lacking in diversity. In fact, a 2022 report by the American Bar Association found the section of taxation to be the least diverse across sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, and race. Our guest today takes a look at that data and possible ways to address the issue. This week's episode is part of a series we've been doing examining how tax rules affect marginalized groups. We'll include links in the show notes to our previous episodes on the intersection of tax and racial inequality, LGBTQ rights, feminism, diversity and international tax policy, tribal taxation, race-based tax weapons, and wealth and inequality. Here to talk more about this is Tax Notes legal reporter, Caitlin Mullaney. Caitlin, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I understand you recently talked with someone about this. Could you tell us about your guest? Yes. I recently spoke with Sinisa Griffiths. She's an associate at the Washington, D.C. office of Skadden. In addition to her work with high stakes and complex tax issues, Sinisa is active in her firm's equity and inclusion initiatives, particularly regarding the hiring and retention of attorneys of color. She is also a member of the law firm Anti-Racism Alliance's Tax System Working Group. And what sort of issues did you get into? We discussed an article that Sinisa recently co-authored, Diversity in the Tax Bar, Reflections on Lessons Learned and a Path Forward. The article focuses on a series of panel discussions examining issues that have made it difficult to attract and retain diverse attorneys in the tax bar and recommendations for addressing those issues. All right, let's go to that interview. Sinisa, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Caitlin. Thank you for having me here today. Your article summarizes six issues that have made attracting and retaining diverse attorneys into the tax bar difficult. Before we start looking at those, do you want to give us some background on the tax bar's historical reputation of diversity? Absolutely. The lack of diversity within big law, particularly at the senior levels, is widely known. The tax bar has historically been even less diverse, and because of that lack of diversity, particularly at the senior levels, underrepresented law students often shy away in favor of more general litigation or transactional practices because of a fear of specializing in a practice where they don't see a clear path to success. So as we mentioned in the article, it's a little bit of a perpetuating cycle. Do you think there's been any sort of increase in the representation of diverse groups over time? I think there has been, but it's slow moving. A few of the efforts we've seen recently are organizations like the ABA creating fellowship programs to attract and integrate diverse groups into the tax bar. I am on the steering committee of one of those fellowships called the Loretta Collins Argrette Fellowship. And the goal of that fellowship is to identify, engage, and infuse historically underrepresented individuals into the tax section, creating a more accessible, equitable, and inclusive pathway to section leadership and supporting expansion, diversification, and inclusiveness of the tax profession by creating a space and sense of belonging for those looking to be more involved in the section. In our first two years of that fellowship, we have been able to place fellows on committees in the tax section and have had them speak at the conference as experts in tax. Great. And your article references a 2022 American Bar Association report which showed the ABA section of taxation having one of the lowest rankings of sexual orientation, gender, ethnic, and racial diversity. What do you think separates it from other sections that rank higher in these areas? It's a bit complicated, Caitlin. First, there's a reputation among practitioners that the tax bar is not diverse. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, diversity begets diversity. And so the fact that new entrants into tax practice don't see persons above them means that they are less likely to enter the profession. Secondly, there is a focus often in the marketplace that tax is focused on math. This perception as tax as a math-focused area of the law means that some people shy away for fear of dealing with numbers. 
unfortunately, this misunderstanding leads many people to step away from tax in favor of more words focused areas of law. As with many other specialty practices, first generation law students, particularly mm -hmm. those that identify as racial minorities, do not have the benefit of previous exposure to the legal practice before law school, which means during the recruiting process, many gravitate towards litigation. Relatedly, many diverse attorneys entering the practice of law look for more accessible areas of practice, which means ones they've seen before. So areas like criminal litigation and civil litigation that they've seen on TV, or ones that they may have experience with like family law when looking for an area to start practice. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. This preeminent and innovative program prepares students to practice tax law at the highest level in the U.S. and abroad. Featuring a low student-to-faculty ratio, cutting-edge technology instruction, and dedicated career support, UCI's graduate tax program helps prepare students for a future in tax law. Program graduates are placed in top tax-related industries, practicing law in many major U.S. cities. Applications are open now. For more information and to apply to this highly selective program, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. What do you think is the greatest difficulty the tax bar faces in attracting and retaining diverse attorneys? I think the greatest difficulty they face is really educating people on what it means to practice tax. I can speak from experience in saying that I didn't exactly know what it meant to practice tax, and it wasn't until my second year of law school that I had exposure to a tax class. Unfortunately, realizing what tax is as a 2L can often be too late when you've already sought out your summer internship program. And so tax really needs to focus on letting people know early about what it could mean to practice tax. Now, moving back to the article, you and the co-authors outlined six top issues with attracting and retaining diverse attorneys into tax practice. Can you give us some background on the selection of these specific issues? Of course. The law firm Anti-Racism Alliance held a 10-part series about diversity in the tax bar. The virtual program was made available free of charge to attorneys and law students across the United States and was co-sponsored by the Section of Taxation, the American College of Tax Council, and the American Tax Policy Institute. Me and other associates at three firms were selected to be reporters on the series. While serving as reporters on the series, me and my co-authors noticed that the panelists coalesced around these six issues that have made the attraction and retention of diverse attorneys increasingly difficult. As reflected in the article, the panelists also pointed to common solutions for alleviating those issues. And can you give us a review of the six issues that were selected? Yes. So the six issues are, one, as I've mentioned a few times already, the public has a limited view of what tax is. Second, implicit bias and stereotype threat are present in the workplace which may make diverse attorneys feel isolated while working in an already complex area. Third, diverse attorneys often lack mentorship and sponsorship that other attorneys may benefit from. Fourth, diverse attorneys often do not receive the same quality assignments that their counterparts may receive. Fifth, Diverse attorneys often do not receive adequate educational opportunities and professional development, which may have even started prior to entry into the workforce. And sixth, some diverse attorneys may feel pressure as the token member of their particular practice group. And with these issues, you mentioned that there were some recommendations and they were included in the article. Can you give us some information about these recommendations to address the issues? Of course. I think the first and one that I've probably mentioned twice already on the podcast is that there's a lot of work to be done on educating 
the population on what it means to practice tax. It's not just math focused, but there is a social impact to tax that would be galvanizing for many young attorneys who see their work as lawyers as impacting the social net positive in the country. Related to implicit bias and mentorship, there is a role for all of us to play in our natural proclivities to to be around people that are like us. And particularly in the workplace, we may need to work against those natural inclinations in order to create an environment that allows for diversity and allowing others to feel included in those environments. Related to assignments, there is a role for us all to play in making sure that assignments are provided equally to all associates or junior members of the team. As we know, whether or not you have quality assignments may be limiting as to what your future skills will be. And so employers having equal opportunities in that regard is essential, which they can do through HR. They could do through professional development staff to ensure that work is being provided equally among their ranks. Lastly, particularly as it relates to being a token member of the community, there's work for everyone to do in treating individuals as individuals. There's already an intrinsic burden that many diverse attorneys feel to perform well for fear that their performance may be attributed to other members that look like them. And so creating an environment where diversity is celebrated and individualism is encouraged will help to release some of that internal pressure so that attorneys can focus on their work in the workplace should be a priority. Support for this podcast is provided by the FRA Private Investment Fund Tax and Accounting Forum. The FRA Private Investment Fund Tax and Accounting Forum takes place December 6th and 7th in Miami. Stay ahead of the ever-changing financial landscape with expert insights on income sourcing, registered versus unregistered funds, and the future of state and local taxation. Ensure confident and compliant filing for your firm's success with the latest best practices to safeguard your funds from costly tax legislation misinterpretations. Join your peers at this one-of-a-kind comprehensive program that attracts tax and accounting firms, fund administrators, attorneys with fund clients, portfolio companies, and funds from around the country. To learn more about this Miami forum, visit fraconferences.com slash PIF. That's fraconferences.com slash PIF. I know you're active in your firm's equity and inclusion initiatives, particularly regarding the hiring and retention of attorneys of color Do you have any advice you'd like to share for firms wishing to institute similar initiatives? Absolutely. Law firms should embrace DEI as a core value and make a commitment to activities such as mentoring and educating law students on the opportunities the practice of, in this case, tax law has to offer. Personally, I've had the opportunity to help with our recruiting efforts and share my experience working in tax law to help excite the next generation of diverse law students about the opportunities available and the importance of bringing diversity to the practice of tax law. For example, I will be co-teaching a tax course at Howard this spring. A number of my colleagues have served as adjuncts at local law schools, including Howard, which provides law students with early exposure to tax so that they can make a decision on whether or not they want to practice tax early in their legal career. Now let's go a little big picture. What are some of the benefits of increasing the diversity of the tax bar? Diversity produces more unique client solutions in a client-focused profession, making them happy and providing them with the best solutions for their unique problems is a must. The practice of tax in particular requires creativity, and so homogeneity of thought is not beneficial. It's actually pretty simple. Diversity begets creativity. Further, 
and maybe this will resonate with people a little more, clients are asking and want to see diverse teams. This is primarily because they understand the benefit of bringing a variety of backgrounds and experience to their cases. And why does this change need to happen? In addition to the creativity we offer clients, the United States is a diverse place. And the tax code in particular has been used to implement a number of social changes from child tax credits to energy credits. Attorneys that practice tax need to reflect the country that they're serving in and have knowledge of the social implications of the code's provisions that they're working within. So in particular to tax diversity of the council that work in this area is essential to making sure the code reflects the needs of the country. Thank you so much, Sunisa. Well, sadly, that's all the time we have for today. Again, I want to refer any interested people to Sunisa and her co-author's article. It's titled Diversity in the Tax Bar, Reflections on Lessons Learned and the Path Forward. Thank you. Now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Saul Meze and Jonathan Bond argue that the court in the Liberty Global case was likely correct in its conclusion. Thomas Godwin and John McKinley explain how recent changes to Section 45Q bring it in the crosshairs of ESG initiatives. In Tax Notes Date, David Swetnam Burlam and Jamie Zoll look at machine learning machinations in the state tax metaverse. Steve Wolodichek explains why the recent Michigan Supreme Court decision in the Vectron Infrastructure Services court case should be reconsidered. In Tax Notes International, Eve Hervé and Lorraine Eden argue that the Shapley value provides a fair and economically sound solution for allocating system profits for transfer pricing purposes. Harold McClure explains the difficulties in the OECD's Amount B pricing matrix and recommends that the OECD consider his model. In Featured Analysis, Ryan Finley explains why lawmakers should stay out of the Microsoft transfer pricing dispute. And finally, on the opinions page, Marty Sullivan looks at which corporations pay the most federal income tax. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at tax stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish, and audio engineer, Peyton Rhodes.